Welcome to r slash Entitled People, where we share stories from your lives about people who think the rules don't apply to them, and they should get what they want. Thank you friends for subscribing to the channel, and for so many likes. And today we have three great stories, so subscribe, hit the like button, and let's begin. The first story, I quit because of my jerk bosses. The second story, after this VP's letter, VP and three senior engineers all was fired. The third story, terrible customer for almost driving his car into my property while running away from the cops. The first story is, my experience with awful bosses. I no longer work at this business and have since moved on to a more rewarding position with higher pay. For obvious reasons, I'll try to explain the business details as vague as I can. Anyways, I worked for this company for approximately four years. Since it was a small company working out of an even smaller office, I experienced their growth firsthand and even helped them move from one of office space to another twice. Since my tenure at this company had been going on for so long, relative to the company's existence, I was the go-to guy and also the only one who performed certain tasks which significantly contributed to the company's growth. I saw myself as a team player and an important asset to the company and tried to help my bosses where I could and often did extra hours without pay and fixed errors at ungodly hours sometimes. All because I felt I was part of this small company and was seen as a valuable worker, colleague and dare I say it friend. My bosses however were not on the same line as I was. They often drilled me into the ground whenever I made a small mistake, which usually took a max of two minutes to fix, and they continually kept piling on more work on top of my workload because I had been doing it for so long I should be able to do more in the same amount of time. Even though this is sound logic to a certain degree, this becomes unrealistic if they keep adding stuff since quality would definitely suffer over quantity. This would result in more errors on my end, and the subsequent drilling by them. One in particular was the worst, but for the sake of this story I'll treat them as one. Furthermore, they wouldn't listen to my advice when telling them the workload was too much. There even was a time I ate up what they said and thought it was me who was not working efficiently enough, and because I thought it was my fault, I'd work those extra hours free of charge. As you can tell I was pretty unhappy at this office and expressed my concerns via email to my bosses multiple times, to which they didn't even have the courtesy to reply to. I assumed it was because they were very busy as this business was done on the side and all of them still worked very high demanding jobs, so they too were constantly juggling multiple things simultaneously. Silly me, they were just really sh bosses. Additionally I was the only male worker and would often see my bosses flirt with my colleagues and waste time with them while I had to keep slaving away at my work because I wouldn't be able to finish it in time otherwise. And my coworkers had tasks which had no deadline so they could stop whenever. This sometimes would slow me down because I'd need them to finish something so I could work and they would have serious delays because of their BS talks, which my male bosses, which of course my bosses would elongate as much as they could. This really stung when my colleagues got to go home and I'd still be sitting at my desk for hours after closing. Things actually got better during the pandemic. I got to work from home and was dependent on no one. I even developed better ways to do my job, which brought up both productivity and effectivity. Midway through the height of the pandemic my bosses decided they wanted to have people at the office again, which was strongly against the government guidelines and I believe illegal at that point. So I pointed this out to them. After a couple of days one of my bosses called me to discuss the issue and was told to come in anyways because we were a small company and because we could maintain the required distance from each other. Mind you, there's no regular cleaning of the office and people never kept their distance. I tried to hold my ground and told him I didn't want to get infected because even though I'm young, I still commute with people of high risk, such as my mother and my girlfriend's parents. This dude basically told me not to see them then, to which I responded, by that same logic, I shouldn't come into the office then, since this is, you know, non-essential work. He did not like that and proceeded to dismiss any argument I made and called them non-arguments. I even asked if it was possible to be kept in the loop to see the company's progress out of genuine interest and as a way to bring the team together. He quickly shot that down because he couldn't be bothered to write a monthly update email. After this back and forth for over 45 minutes the call ended and I was fuming. The first thing I told my girlfriend was, I'm quitting. And so I did and my life is so much better now. I'm finally finishing up my bachelor's degree and I'm making more money and get to go home with no work to do the moment I leave. It is such a breath of fresh air. The second story is, Email from newish VP of Engineering, 5-13-2002. There's a good chance that this email might do one of the following to you. 1. Anger. 2. Frighten. 3. Have a positive impact. My goal is for number 3 to happen, but I must say what must be said. 
our delivery organization needs an attitude adjustment. First, a little perspective. I've been at company for over 10 months now. During that time period, I've sat back and observed a number of interesting things and behaviors. Believe me, I've been on both sides of the new team being brought in situation, and I realize it isn't overly comfortable for those folks who have been at a company for a while, or the new folks coming in. For that reason, I typically will do my best over the first six months to be sensitive to the range of actions and emotions that typically go on. This include 1. Old team thinks the new team wants to change everything without any good reason. Everything works, so why change it? 2. New team thinks the old team is not opening their minds to new ideas. There's definitely a better way to do things. Typically within six months, things get better and the old team and the new team eventually work things out and become the newest team. I've actually waited an additional four months longer than usual, and the newest team is yet to emerge. This makes me very unhappy. So what do I do? Well, this is when I change things to the way I want them. I will no longer wait for the correct behaviors to surface. Here's how it'll work from tomorrow forward. I was once told that there are actually six options that a boss and an employee have when they're not in sync. One, the boss is terminated by his or her boss and the employee gets his or her way. Two, the boss quits and the employees get his or her way. Three, the boss changes his or her mind and defers control to the employee, therefore giving in to his or her way. Four, the employee changes his or her behavior and gets in sync with the boss. Five, the employee quits. Six, the boss terminates the employee. The above is actually held true throughout my career, and I suspect it is held true in yours as well. Given the above, I can tell you that number one, number two, and number three are not going to happen. VP's boss is in full support of my actions, and I'm committed to making company a success by leveraging my knowledge and experience in making engineering and PS teams successful. So that really leaves the last three options. We're now at the point where you and I will be making some decisions. So what are some of the things that will be happening here from this day forward? One, we will execute, with extreme prejudice, the plans that have been set forth in our version 3.0 architecture. This includes Anthem architecture and all of its pieces, VTL, Turbine, etc. IPDO is the transaction engine. Oracle is the data warehouse. RI is the major piece of comms. JRules is the rules engine. We will begin doing things the right way instead of the convenient way. This includes support a schema and DTD structure that's very close to the standard, if not a standard. Creating the appropriate documentation before development, architecture, functional spec, etc. Publishing our work to source control. Following correct CM protocols. Following correct QA methodology. Conducting peer reviews. Shortcuts are killing us. 3. We will check our attitudes at the door. I don't require you to like each other, but I do require you to work together in an effective manner. You're all owners of this company. 4. We will be acting entrepreneurial. I know many of you have families, but we need to commit to long hours and tireless commitment to excellent results. Entrepreneurial companies work nights and weekends to ensure success. No, many of you work hard, but I don't get a feeling that we like what we do and are committed to making it successful. VP's boss shares my feelings on this one and has gone as far as to prove his suspicions. 5. We will not miss project plan dates. We will give each other support to ensure that we don't. 6. We will make the sales organization successful. Without sales, our stock is worth nothing. None of us came here for that result. Net, net. I'm done with screwing around. Many of you might think I'm a pretty nice guy, but you don't want me to feel the way I'm currently feeling for too long. I was brought here to build a successful engineering and recently PS team. VP's boss has empowered me to do so in any way that makes sense. We've made some great hires in the sales, product marketing, and PS areas, and we won't waste the investment. So the decision is really yours. The good news is that you're in control of two of the three remaining aforementioned options. Number four, change the behavior, or number five, decide this company is not really where you want to be. I'm certainly open to answer questions regarding the above, but I must warn you, my patience is thin. I suggest you digest the above and schedule time with me tomorrow if you want to talk. Over and out. Regards, VP of Engineering. Vice President, Engineering, The Company. This email came out on Monday. We all stewed for a few days, but when I came in on Friday, the VP of Engineering and the three senior engineers of the five he had brought with him had all been fired. He was right about the choices, just not the one that quickly happened. And the last story is, Guy tries to drive into my office after realizing he's effed. For a little background, I worked at Extraordinary Hotel, where there are many addicts, for two years as the full-time auditor, and I saw some SH. More will come later. But the one I can never not tell people when they ask for stories is the story of Addicts Man and his pizza. So it was just about midnight on a very busy night, 
Summer in Cali, you know how it goes. This, like I said, was an extraordinary hotel. So we charged per person and had an agreement with the DA of our county that we would get every ID from each person in the room. Kids excluded, obviously. This is important later. I get a call from a room, 119 if I remember correctly, asking me how to dial out. I recognize the voice as one of our regulars. We'll call him Kevin. K slurring his words. I'm trying to order a pizza. How do I dial out? M. You just gotta hit 81 in the area code and the number and you should be fine. K. Okay. Click. Two minutes later he calls back. K. That didn't work. How the F do I dial out, man? I just want an effing pizza. M. It's 81 in the... Halfway through the sentence I hear two other voices in the back. Kevin always only pays for himself. He's cheap. It's a one bedroom. There shouldn't be other voices. M. Kevin, do you have other people in that room with you? K. Click. M. Oh, no, you don't. Calls back. K. Hello? M. Kevin, I heard the other people. You know we charge per person. K. Click. M. Ah, uh, okay then. That's how you want to be tonight? I head over to the room and knock on the door. We were essentially security overnight too, so this wasn't out of my duties. I knock and Kevin opens the door. I'm greeted with two unregistered persons without clothes, tequila, and vodka bottles everywhere. And I mean everywhere. And Kevin, who I assume was watching from the chair, sat right in the corner. I laugh a little and I say, Kevin, who are these people? You only paid for one adult. They have to leave or you have to give me their IDs and pay for them. Kevin did not like this. So in a drunken grunting way, he comes after me. I back up and Kevin follows. He's following me all the way to the office and the whole time I'm like, don't effing do this, Kevin. I don't want to hurt you. Stop coming after me. I'm calling the cops, etc. I couldn't hit him because of our policy. So right before the office, he turns and runs back into the room. I got cops there in about three minutes. The cops go to the room and Kevin barricades himself in the bathroom. I'm done. The cops are done. Everyone just hates this effing guy for being a pee. I come in to help and I hear the cops sighing and going, come on, Kevin, this is effing stupid. Just open the door. He does and bolts out of the room with a screwdriver. I see he's out, so I go back to the office thinking the cops will handle it. Just a drunk dude with a screwdriver. I'm checking some guests in, hoping I can get them in before they see anything. What I didn't know at the time was the cops didn't catch him and screwdriver in hand, he made it outside to his truck, hot-wired it somehow, and is peeling out to leave. Just as another cop SUV pulls into the driveway, Kevin in his truck is rounding the building. He sees the cop, cop sees him and blocks the only exit. What does Kevin do? He sees me and decides that he would drive up onto the grass over the curb and barrels towards the office. But right after he goes up, he gets his back tire stuck in the storm drain. Five cops swarm his truck and pull him out through the driver's side window, slamming his face into the asphalt. Me, everyone watching, and the people I'm checking in all go, oof, when we see this. He's handcuffed and put into a car. The cop gets his SH and have a tow truck come get the truck, and he's booked into jail shortly after. I check the booking logs. Needless to say, I gave the people I checked in a heavy discount. Couple weeks pass and I get a call at work from Kevin and friends saying that I stole his backpack. I say, no, Kevin, the effing cops did when they body slammed you. And by the way, you're on our DNR list now, so if I see you on the property again, I'll be calling the cops. And hang up. Haven't heard anything about him since, and that was late 2018, early 2019, I think. I work in a different city now, but everyone asks for stories from the crack hotel, and I can't help but give it to them. All for a pizza. I hope you love these stories. Subscribe, hit the like button, and turn on notifications.